Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. On the show today, we have my friend Brian Smith. I met Brian at the Afterlife Symposium back in 2018 and quickly became friends. Brian and his wife, Ty, are the leaders of the Cincinnati chapter of the Helping Parents Heal organizations and organizers of the Helping Parents Heal online group. You can find out more at helpingparentsheal.org about all the amazing groups they have. And we're going to find out about Brian's story now. Brian Smith, a warm welcome, my friend, to We Don't Die Radio. Thanks, Sandra. It's good to be here. It's very good to have you here. And I remember when I first met you, thinking, who is this wonderful man? And I'm so grateful that we became friends. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that day very well. Mm -hmm. And we did a selfie. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I'm going to use that selfie in this episode. So tell us your story. Uh, What do you do for a living? Well, you know, where you live in Ohio and talk a little bit about yourself and your wife and um, how your story unfolds. What I do for a living um, is I run an an internet company. We sell hair and skin care supplies. Um, It's an an online online store that my wife and I have been running together for the last uh, 17 years. We live in Southwest Ohio, just outside of Cincinnati. Uh, I have two daughters, uh, Kayla and Shana. Shana is in spirit. She passed in 2015. But she's still a very, very active part of our family, still motivates me to do what I do every day. Um, So when Shana passed in 2015, um, I started just a whole series of synchronicities happened that led me to a group called Helping Parents Heal, uh, which you mentioned earlier. And my my wife and I, we started the Cincinnati chapter, uh, I think it was in 2016. We ran that for about a year. And actually, then we transitioned over to running the online group, which is Helping Parents Heal Online, which is a, a Facebook group. And we started that in um, 2000, let's see, this, this 2019, I guess 2017. And uh, we've got about 4,600 members in that group now. So that group is for parents whose children have transitioned and are in the spirit world. And we try to help them understand their children uh, did not die, basically that they're still here with them, still very active part of their lives and want us to be happy. So we uh, we talk about things that help people understand the continuation of life, um, things like near-death experiences, uh, mediumship, all the afterlife studies that are going on, things of that nature. So as I said, we've been running that group for a couple of years now. Can I ask a little bit about your daughter and what happened, if it's appropriate? Yeah, sure. Um Shana was uh, extremely active, very popular, outgoing girl. She was uh, 15 years old, as I said. She was a freshman in high school. Um, and in, in the school system that we're in, the freshmen go to a separate building. So she was at the, at the freshman building. She never actually made it to main campus. Uh, she was a basketball player from the time she was five years old up until, I guess, she was about 13 or 14. And she had played at a national level for basketball, went to the national finals a couple of times for AAU, came in second place in, in the championship, national championship. She decided in eighth grade she wanted to play volleyball. She just gave up basketball and decided to play volleyball. And Shana was great at everything she tried, especially she was really coordinated with her hands. So we said, Shana, if you're going to switch sports, you might not do so well in volleyball because you've never played before. Well, long story short, she made the freshman team uh, her first time out. Um, she tried out for a uh, AAU team. She made the national team for that that team, and actually was on a traveling team the last year that she was uh, she was with us. So she and my wife Ty were in Orlando uh, at the national tournament the week before Shana passed. This was in the summer. It was uh, early June or middle June. Uh, came back from the tournament, and she was you know back home. And she just passed in her sleep. It was very sudden. It was totally unexpected. She did have a heart condition that we knew about. Uh, she was seeing a cardiologist for every couple of years. Uh, but she had been cleared for sports. Uh, she never had any issues where she even passed out or anything. She was on no, med- no medications. Um, and the conditions she had, if it had affected her, it should have affected her while she was active. It should not have affected her while she was asleep. So I say all that to say that it was just totally unexpected. We just found her in her room um, that morning and she was unresponsive. 
I can't even imagine. I'm so sorry. I know we believe in the afterlife. I know she's very much alive, but there is, I can't imagine anything worse. Um, Yeah. You know, it it was obviously a a huge, huge shock to the system. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I think things happen for a reason. I always had this, this fear of death myself from the time I was a young kid. And that was due to toxic religion. I, I feared God, I feared death. Um, and so I had done a lot of studies on the afterlife to just kind of alleviate my own uh, anxieties. So a couple of years actually prior to Shana's passing, or actually let's see, at this point, yeah, several years before prior to Shana's passing, I had started studying a lot about the afterlife, reading everything I get my hands on as far as near-death experiences, afterlife communications, you know, mediumship, et cetera. So I have to say, in one sense, when Shana did transition, I never worried about where Shana was. Um, I always knew that, that Shana was OK. Um, so that was that was, I would say, kind of a blessing in disguise. Uh, still had to go through the normal pr- grieving process, still go through grieving process. But um, that was at least one thing that I was spared. Yeah, the grieving process is, to me, the worst pain any human being will ever have to endure so it's brutal yeah yeah it is it is really brutal but um again i don't feel like i was ever you know left alone um at the time when this happened i had started uh walking for exercise so Mm -hmm. i'd walk i don't know probably half an hour every morning or so i listen to music and stuff um and then after Shana passed I, for some reason I decided to look for a podcast on grief. I don't know why. I didn't even, didn't even really listen to podcasts that much then. But I was like looking for something I could listen to as I walked. And I think the first podcast I came across it, it was one of the first two at least was your your podcast. And I listened to every episode. Uh, I I caught up on the back t- backlog. I listened to every episode coming up. And I found your audio about grief and I downloaded that. And I remember lying on my bed and listening to that. And that helped me just so tremendously to understand what grief is, what I was going through, what I could expect. Uh, Then I invited my wife to listen to that audio. We listened to it together. And that that helped us tremendously. Uh, That was just that was a real blessing for us. So I want to thank you, you know, for that. You are most welcome. Thanks for listening. And I don't really believe in synchronicities that have us be here today. I've witnessed so many of these. uh, My dad used to always say coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous, you know, and I love that. Mm -hmm. But I I do think with Shana's transition and my dad going the way he did and me going on my journey to investigate, you doing your preliminary research just to comfort yourself it's all part of a much bigger picture and like what you and ty do today along with helping parents heal unfortunately you couldn't be doing so much service had you not been where you've been and i think like i say my dad shana all of the other loved ones that might be in the unseen world have done their part because it's time to heal Time to help people get this very real information about the afterlife and um, and tools to live. Yeah, well, um, I think I, I believe, and I didn't when Shana passed necessarily uh, believe in in soul planning. Uh, never really give that, that kind of stuff much thought. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, after Shana did pass, um, I mean, I would it would take me hours to tell you all the synchronicities that led me to where I am today, but. Someone told me to contact a guy named Mark Ireland, who I'd never heard of, uh, said he had lost his son. He had written a couple of books and maybe Mark could help me. So I reached out to him. He emailed me back and sent me his, his books. And I read those, found out he had started this organization called Helping Parents Heal. Uh, my wife and I had never been to Phoenix before. And we always went to the beach for vacation with the girls. And our, my older daughter, Kayla, said, I don't want to go to the beach this year. Let's go somewhere completely different. Let's go to the desert. So we booked a vacation to Phoenix, and it turns out that and we were staying only half an hour or so away from where Elizabeth Blasson lives, who was the founder of Helping Parents Heal. So um, I, I knew Mark. Mark had talked about Helping Parents Heal. Elizabeth was living there, so we met her for breakfast. She said, when you guys are up for it, why don't you become leaders? So we became leaders of Helping Parents Heal, which led us to all the conferences and stuff we went to. And 
which led me to the conference where I met, you know, where I met you. So I don't think any of this stuff happens by accident. And the more I see unfolding, the more I guess I can trust that, you know, there's a reason for it. Um, and Shane is just the kind of person that would have said, hey, I'll be the one to go at 15. That'll be fun. Um, <laughs> and it's just the way she lived her life. Everything for her was an adventure. She when she was about 10, I guess she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which was it was really, really bad. Her numbers were like off the chart wow. bad. Um, and, and it would have been crippling, but we found medications that helped. And that was, that was great. But Shane had been healthy up until that point. And I remember the first time she had that blood drawn, she was like, I wonder what it's like to have blood drawn. I mean, that's just the way she, she approached everything in life. And she would say things like, I like to break my leg so I can see what it's like to walk on crutches. Um, and we're like, Shana, don't wish for that. Well, then she actually tore her ACL playing basketball and got the opportunity to walk on crutches. Mm -hmm. But she would, that's just the way she she embraced everything with life. She just went for everything and was a, a real leader. Um, she had a group of, of girls that followed her, even though she was younger than the, the, ch the children that she was around because she actually worked a year ahead in school. So that's just who she was. And it's the legacy that she has left for someone that was only here for 15 years. It's still... Um, it amazes me. I mean, at our memorial service, uh, we had no idea how many people were going to be there. So we had a place that held about 500 people. Um, there were at least 750 people that came through. Um, my wife and I greeted people as they came through for like two hours. And finally, we had to cut the line off because we had to start the service. But the line was like out the door Amazing. for a girl who was said 15 years old. And we homeschooled her every year except for her last two years in school. So she wasn't even in public school for most of her life. Um, but that was just the kind of impact that she had. And I hate to say that in the past tense because her impact goes forward. Um, you know, again, she only played one year of volleyball, but they put up a more memorial in the high school to her and two other girls on the team that passed around the same time. Um, so that's just how much she impressed, the, you know, the, the, the people at her school. So very proud of her. And uh, what I do now is try to make her proud of me. What's your other daughter like? Uh, my other daughter is um, she's she and Shana had different personalities in terms of Kayla is, is a little bit more quiet and reserved. Uh, both, you know, very intelligent. I think very attractive girls. Uh, Kayla is um, she just graduated from college from University of Toledo a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's interesting. After Shana passed, Kayla kind of said, okay, instead of me going into something that I don't really, I'm not really passionate about, I'm going to change my major. So she changed to psychology. She wants to work with children. Um, so she's actually uh, home over the summer. She'll be working on her master's starting in the fall. Uh, but she's a, she's a very, very compassionate person. Uh, she and Shana are like twins. I mean, they were, they were three years apart in age, but really pretty much like twins, but you no know, best friends of each other. That's really so, nice. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, we really worried about the impact that Shana's passing would have on, on Kayla. Um, but she's been, she's been amazingly resilient. Um, you know, it's, I think we find out when things like this happen that we are as strong as we need to be. And I'm really proud of, of her for sticking it out. We said, you know, if you want to take a year off of school, you know, that's perfectly understandable. Nobody would blame you. Uh, but she went right back and, you know, finished school, uh, caught, Took her an extra year because of the change of majors, but she finished up and she's doing great. Oh, super. And tell me about Ty. I'm not, I know you, but I've never spent time with her. How is she doing? And I know she's actively involved with you also with helping parents heal. Yeah, I got to say, I'm really proud of her too. Um, you know, before this happens, I said because of my, my background with religion and my fear of death and all that kind of stuff, I had studied this stuff like crazy. I had started meditating um, you know, I, I was, I was really into it. She, not so much. She, you know, she would read books for book club, you know, but she always read fiction. She never listened to the podcast I listened to or anything like that. But after Shana passed, um, she has made a huge shift. Um, so it's interesting. Her father had passed a couple of years earlier from Alzheimer's, but he was, you know, like late seventies. So, you know, she thought, well, this is the way, this is a natural course of things. You know, he's, he's in heaven now. I'll see him, you know, maybe one day. And I think she kind of just set that aside. 
But when you lose a child, it it breaks you wide open and you have to know where are they? Not just are they in heaven you know, or maybe they're in heaven. You have to know. And she um, and again, I remember the first thing was that that grief uh, audio that you had made. You know, she and I sat down, listened to that together. And then she started, you know, finding her own podcast, listening to some of the podcasts that I listened to, um, doing her own, uh, you know, research and, and reading and stuff. Um, she was the one that found um, Suzanne Giesman, who is a medium that we both know where we're actually becoming friends with now. We went to her conference down in Florida, which is where we met Tracy Susie and Beth West, who are the other co-leaders of the online group. So that led to that, but that was all kind of instigated by by my wife Ty. So she's really, you know, she's jumped in, and she, um, you know, again, you you think of a mother losing a daughter, and both my girls look just like my wife. They're they're like so close. Uh, they were so close to each other. So I, I didn't know how you know she would take it, but she's done very well and been amazingly resilient, and really stepped up to help other people. Well, that's just it. This being of service is such a beautiful thing, especially when we are caught up in grief. And when the time is right, you you know, but to be able to give back and serve, it it really does help with the healing process. So. Yeah, it really does. You know, um, there has, you have to take time for yourself. Mm-hmm. And of course, depending on where you are when the grief hits you. Um, that may be a longer, shorter period of time. It's different for everybody. But for me, a big part of my healing process is helping other people. Um, so it was pretty quickly after, you know, Shana passed that we decided we wanted to lead a chapter of Helping Parents Heal. And at the time, I think they had a policy, not really a policy, but they wanted you to be in about a year in before you started trying to you know, lead other people. But um, we just felt like we felt moved to, you know, jump in, you know, faster. And so um, I w- I'd encourage people that when something like this strikes, it does help to help other people. And being around the parents, you know, we were around um, the people that were that, that more time in, that had been longer since their kids passed. Those people were inspirational to us because when you look at when, when your child passes, you're like, I don't, or I can speak for myself. I don't want to be here. You know, I want to be where she is. So that's, you don't, I don't, you don't even know if you're going to survive it. So being, seeing people that have survived it and uh, like Elizabeth Bassan, who's just an amazing human being and seeing what she's, you know, made of this since her son Morgan passed, you know, that gave me inspiration. And then seeing people coming in after me and being able to help them, you know, gave me motivation. So um, I started a blog not too long after after Shana passed, which is kind of an open diary. And I would blog about my day and stuff. But even when I as down as I, you know, I, I have been, I always tried to bring some sort of hope to people to say and to let them know, you know, you're going to feel this way and it's OK to feel this way. And it's it's normal to feel this way. But, you know, if you hang in there for another day, you know, you can you can overcome it. Do you still have that blog? Yeah, I do. I do still have that blog. It's um, it's shaynaelaine.com. So it's S-H-A-Y-N-A. And their middle name is E-L-A-Y-N-E. Um, so it's shaynaelaine.com. It has over a thousand entries. Um, wow. Shana keeps telling me that I'm going to turn it into a book someday. So we'll see if that happens. But that so that's come through several different uh, mediums I've had readings with. But uh, as I said, I, I kind of started as a as a diary. And then I, when I realized a few people were, were reading it, you know, then I had to kind of look, you know, be a little bit more outward focus, focused. And it's just, you know, it's my observations. It's it's some of it's just like what happened to me that day. But a lot of it's things that I get inspired by. And, and, and frankly, I get downloads almost daily from Shana, higher source, angels, whatever. Uh, I wake up in the morning. I just have these downloads and I just write them down. That's pretty cool that they come in like that. Uh, I want to ask you, I'm just caught off guard with the downloads because I, I know that I've had feelings and it's like, where did they come from? And I just never mm-hmm. call them downloads, but I, I get that. Um, can you talk about some of the signs you've had from Shana? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. It's like where to start. Shana is an 
excellent communicator. So we get like you get these lists of signs that people talk about, like, you know, strange animal behavior, uh, feathers, uh, coins, uh, electronics, um, which saying it's all the above. So, you know, it's, I remember one time I can give you a couple of examples, but one time um, after Shana passed, I was like, okay, I want dimes. I want something specific, not just pennies or whatever. So if I find a dime, I'm going to take that as a sign from Shana. So this was about three months after she had passed and uh, Kayla and, and Ty and I were up um, put in Bay, which is a place about three hours from us up on the Lake Erie, up in Lake Erie, Ohio. And I was out for my morning walk and I, I was having a really rough day and I said, Shana, I need a sign for you today. So I'd like to find a dime sometime today. So finished my walk, came back, picked up Ty and Kayla. We were getting the shuttle to go to catch the the ferry. And uh, Ty and Kayla get in the front seat and it was a van. So I decided I was going to get in the back seat. So as I bent down to get in the van and the back seat, I looked under the seat and there was a dime, just a single dime sitting under the seat. Nice. And so it's not just the fact that I found the dime, but, you know, it's it's the timing uh, of finding it. Um, on a day when I specifically asked her for that specific sign, um, Shana will, she'll mess with electronics. Um, unfortunately, sometimes she breaks things like, what she do you mean? My computer. <laughs> well, my computer one day, just the hard drives just started acting really, really weird. And it, it would, it wouldn't boot. It was just, and it was about three days and I was, I was just getting really frustrated. And I called the guy that works on my machines and goes, I think you're going to need a new computer. I don't know what's going on with that. And I just said to Shana, I said, Shana, I think you're doing this. Could you just knock it off? And the next day, it just started working. And uh, a couple of days or weeks later, I had a meeting reading. They said, Shana said she messes with your computer. And again, so it's the Great. specific sign, but it's then someone else telling me a couple of weeks later, yeah, Shana said she did that. Um, so we get we get stuff like that. There's not too long after she passed, um, my daughter Kayla was sitting out on the deck and she said, no, daddy, come here. I'm in my office working. I was like, okay, Kayla, what do you want? So I, I go out on the deck and she said, there's this butterfly and she's been hanging around me for like 10 minutes. She keeps looping, flying away, coming back. And uh, I said, okay, that's really interesting, sweetie. So I come back in my office and I'm working about 15 minutes. Later, she said, she calls me again and I go out. The butterfly is still there and it sits on the rail and it lets her touch it. Um, so we've, we, you know, stuff like that. Um, Kayla's had some pretty miraculous uh, dreams. Um, You know, she's had dreams that are kind of uh, prophetic. So she's seen things like in her dream. And then later on, we'll see it in person. Um, She had a dream once. Uh, She and Shana were in this church and she said it was it was white on the inside and they were in the church and they were coloring or something. And uh, Shana, Shana loves sweets. So Shana's like, you know, they were eating ice cream and Shana goes, well, you can have all the ice cream you want here. So she has this dream. So a couple of weeks later, um, I just had this urge to watch this, watch this movie. Uh, I think it's Heavens for Real. It's, it's the movie about the little boy that dies and goes to heaven. Yes. So I'm like, I don't know why I had this urge to watch this movie. And I was like, I have to watch it today. So it, Red Box was sold out all over town. You couldn't find it. I drove to a location. I finally got it. I came back. Neither Kayla nor my wife were interested in watching it. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to put it on. So I put it on. They get into the movie. At one point in the movie, the, the father keeps asking the little boy about what Jesus looked like. And they kept kept showing him pictures. And he's like, no, that's not him. That's him. One day he's walking by and he sees on the father's computer this image of Jesus that was drawn by this little girl named, I think her name is Aki Ann. Mm-hmm. But she started drawing when she was a very little girl. And she draws these really, really realistic pictures of heaven and Jesus and stuff. So after the movie's over, I was telling Kayla about this little girl and how amazing she is. So I looked up on my iPad some of her paintings. And Kayla's scrolling through the paintings and suddenly she just like her, her, she like, she starts shaking and she can't speak. And I'm like, what's going on? Were you okay? And I thought she was having a seizure or something. She said, where is this church? And I said, well, sweetie, I don't know. And she said, is it white on the inside? And I'm like, well, I don't know, sweetie. It's just a painting. And she said, this is a church that Shana and I were in in my dream. And the picture was titled something like heaven. So this girl had drawn this image of of this church. And Kayla said that was a church in her dream. And she had never seen the painting before. Amazing. So, and that's just, you know, Shane has been, it's been four years now. And she sends us signs, you know, like I said, all the time. 
Um, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're not, they're very amazing. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, we'll have, we've had dimes appear in the house. I'm walking downstairs at the basement. My wife, she worked her office in the basement and I'm like, why is this dime on the steps? I, just, I don't know. It wasn't there when I came down and it's just there. She's a powerful girl. I can just tell by who she was in life that she's still stirring things up and making things happen and wants to participate as much as she can and figure out what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, maybe she gave a little too much pressure to the computer to <laughs> break <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, she, well, she, but she yeah, fixed she's, it. I, there was an outlet and the house just st- suddenly stopped working and I was going to replace it. And I was, I was driving out to get, you know, get the replacement for it. I was going to have an electrician put it in. And I said, Shana, could you just please stop breaking things? And I thought one last time before I go get the outlet or call the electric. Actually, I recalled the electrician. He was scheduled to come out. I, I hit the, uh, the GFI one more time and it came back on. <laughs> so uh, and then she's done things like um, so we, we've got come to know Suzanne Giesman, who's, yes. uh, you know, and I know, you know, Suzanne, she's an amazing medium. And Shana will drop in on her and just give her evidence. Uh, so. One time Suzanne calls and there's, she said, uh, she done a reading with it. She said, I'm seeing this thing. It's like a purple, like Christmas ornament. It's like, it's like glass and it's got all these refractory things coming out of it. And she sent it as an image of what she thought it looked like. Well, it turns out that Shana's volleyball team had given her this thing. It's called a happy thought bubble. And it's a purple ornament. Uh, we've got it hanging above the sink in our kitchen. So Suzanne had somehow seen this ornament. So Suzanne has included Shana because of some of the great evidence. And I won't tell you all of it because it, it gets boring, but it's amazing all the things she sent through Suzanne. So Suzanne's in, included Shana in one of her presentations about as one of her you know, communicators. So one day Suzanne calls up and says, I just got to ask you this. Is there a crack in the happy thought bubble? And we're like, yeah, no, I don't think so. Not that I know of. We're looking at it. It looks fine. I take it down. And at the very top of the bubble where it, where it attaches to where the string is, there's this hairline fracture. That is so small, I would have never seen it. But I was like, there's a crack in it. So she's done things like that, too. Your words are so important because I've heard a lot of people say, I haven't gotten a sign. I haven't gotten a sign. And the way you would ask for a dime and you're in, it sounds to me like you're in constant conversation with your daughter. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how many of us, myself included, who would love to have a sign, but on my part, I haven't kept the relationship going. And I'm so busy in my head, or I think we human beings are, that maybe signs are happening and we're just not paying attention. Yeah, well, I think, um, first of all, you have to be open to all kinds of signs. And, and everybody, I think every spirit is a different type of communicator. So some people say, I want to dream. And they'll say, I haven't had a sign. And you're like, well, what do you mean? Well, I they, they specifically said, I want a dream. I want, And it's like, well, maybe your loved one is not good at communicating through dreams. Or maybe you're not ready to receive through dreams. Um, so you have to be open to the various ways that spirit communicates. And then you have to be looking for it because otherwise finding a dime is just random. You know, uh, a bird flying into your house could just be random. But if you start looking for the patterns of these things, um, then then it starts to make sense. And what I've been told and what I've heard is your loved ones, once you start acknowledging those signs, they'll start giving you that sign more and more. Um, so it's it's a it is a two way communication. I think uh, a journal would be good too to keep. And even if you know sometimes it's hard, I recommend often to have an empty chair next to you, put a cup there, have a cup of coffee have Mm -hmm. a conversation that might not be so easy, but if you have a journal and this is what I noticed today and in the journal, write your loved one, they can hear you. And Mm -hmm. even if it's written out and to, to make that a habit, I can't help but think that things will begin to unfold that way. And I think Brian too, just because I've interviewed enough people who've either had a near death experience or a medium, there's halls of learning that they go to, to learn. So I just don't think the moment we transition that we have all the knowledge in the universe. So I think it might take something. 
Yeah, yeah, they they don't become all powerful. They don't become all knowing. And I know, I know uh, these people, you know, too. Suzanne Wilson talks about mm-hmm. how they do go and they learn, and then they learn how to communicate through animals and birds and stuff. It's not something that just comes naturally. Um, and some people are, I think, better at it quicker than others. Uh, Shayna always picked up on everything really quickly, so maybe it's maybe it's easy for her, um, and maybe for some other people it's not quite so easy. Um, but again, you have to be open, I think, to different ways. And I, I guess the other thing is when you when you someone's 15 when they pass and they live in your house, you know, it's it's different than losing someone who's you're not living with anymore. I mean, I, I saw Shana literally every day. Yes. And so with that to be cut off as suddenly as it was, it was just natural for me to try to maintain that relationship. Um, and and I still do. I, even though Shana would be. 19 now I still think of her as a 15 year old so she's still my baby and I still you know I still want to be in communication with her and she wants to be in communication with you too yeah so yeah. clear and who planted that thought in your mind to see the heaven is for real movie so that you would drive to more yeah, than one you know, red box was, to find it after I, I was driving around I'm like why am I, why do I want to see this movie it's frankly it's a cheesy movie and I, I don't know why is and why did I have to see it that day? But um, you know I don't remember if Kayla was because Kayla you know she did, wasn't living with us she was at school so she happened to be home that weekend and I really had no plans for her to watch it because I knew she would she was not interested in it. Um, so yeah, the way that all had to work out, you know that's that's not just a coincidence. Not at all. And the Heaven is for real movie. Anyone who doesn't know, it's a story of a young boy who got very sick and in his out-of-body experience. Uh, he saw Jesus, but he also saw, I think it was his grandfather. Yeah, his grandfather that he had never met. That yeah. he had never met, and it wasn't until the father went through the photo albums and he could point him right out, and he says, you know, what else do you know? And then that painting from that gal, Akien, she is like pro- child prodigy, how great mm-hmm. her paintings are. Her artwork for such a young age is just brilliant. But she's got this dynamic picture of Jesus that's yes. so powerful. It's a little boy in the movie, and it's based on a true story. So even though it's a movie, yes. it's based on a true story. He recognized that Jesus as the Jesus from his dream. And what is really interesting is Akien, the painter, did not grow up in a religious family and wasn't even told about Jesus in the Bible or any of that. Yeah. That just came to her. Yeah, I'm giving myself goosebumps right now. Well, yeah, yeah, I, and, I, and and so again, the movie, the little boy just happened to be walking by because his father was showing me all these pictures. I don't think his father, at least the way it was portrayed in the movie, I don't think he even showed it to him. He just like, yeah, that's him. Um, I I don't remember exactly, but you know, the fact that you know that had to happen, and then like I said, for Kayla to have been in the room, and then for Kayla to say, that's the church, and Kayla, I don't know if she really likes this, but Kayla's intuitive. And so she has abilities more than, than most of us do. Um, and she said she's had several dreams of Shana. Uh, and that's one that I remember most vividly because of the validation mm-hmm. that came after she had the dream. She told us about it. We're like, that's really interesting. So you had a great you know, uh, dream visit with Shana. But then for her to say, that's the very church that I saw in my dream, I thought was pretty cool. That's great. And then you and I just participated in an online Zoom interview which I just will just mention here quickly, but episode 320, mm-hmm. Brian is the mystery guest and he got a medium reading from Carrie McLeod and Philip Dykes. And it was, a, it, it is an episode about mediumship and the difference between mental mediumship and our evidential mediumship and psychic abilities. And it, for all of us to know what's available in a good evidential reading but for me, you know, I think it's my idea to have an interview and have a mystery guest and do all this. But uh, no, clearly <laughs> it wasn't my idea. It came in from a higher source. And I thought, geez, I need, who can I pick? And Brian, w- within a split second, there was your face in my mind. Mm. And it was like, okay. And um, so you said, yes, so I'm so grateful for that. And then, you know, Phil and Carrie didn't know you. You didn't know Phil and Carrie. I do know your story mm-hmm. and about Shana. And, you know, I'm sitting there and your grandmother came in first. And 
good and good. And um, it was almost, I don't want to say this to be funny, but like a warm up act to build yeah. up the power. Yeah. And then Phil came in with uh, talking about Shana. And it was just, I mean, brought tears to my eyes as I was listening to the information and the accuracy. And, you know, this wasn't all planned by me. No. It, but it's these kind of stories that need to get out that this is real, very real. Yeah. You know, I, and I've heard, and it's hard for us, I think, humans to accept that most of the ideas that we have are not our own, that they're, that they're planted by uh, higher beings, our, our higher self, um, our loved ones in spirit or whatever. Um, and I absolutely know that that's true. And, and by the way, uh, I do write quite a bit, and Shana takes credit for my writing. Um, she, she's told me through a medium that she's a better writer than I am. Uh, <laughs> and she, she was an amazing, amazing writer. We found some things that she had written after she passed that we had no idea she had written. Um, so she, she definitely, um, inspires me. Um, so like I said, I, I, I wake up in the morning and I have these, these ideas that these downloads that I have, this, this is what I've got to do. So, um, yeah, she's definitely put me on a path and I've taken, you know, I did. I did. I have the blog, but I've actually started another website where I'm doing uh, a life coaching business and um, stuff like that. So, you know, she's kind of said, "Okay, it's time for me to shift from what I've been doing into something different." So, um, it's interesting to see how it's all unfolding. Can you share that website with us? Is it open? Ah, uh, yeah, the website is open. It's uh, grief to growth dot com. So it's grief g r i e f the number two uh, growth dot com. Um, so again, I, I, it's just wild how this stuff worked out. I've been volunteering for helping parents heal for the last three years and working with parents and mediums and healers and people like yourself and getting to meet all these people. And, uh, I want to be able to contribute myself. So I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm with helping parents heal. It's a closed group. So I, we only share within the group for the privacy of the parents. Right. So I want to, I want to expand what I'm doing to the public. So Again, I got to give a lot of credit to you for inspiration. I've actually started a podcast. Uh, I've recorded my first three or four episodes. I've got a few out there already. Um, so I want to I want to give back as much as I can. How do we find the podcast through your website, Grief to Growth? Yeah, it's on the website, and it's also just grief to growth dot com. Our grief to growth uh, is the pot name of the podcast as well. Okay. Four. So uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's. It's weird to say that it's really exciting, but it is really exciting to um, to feel like, you know, I kind of feel like I'm doing what I was supposed to do. I was mm -hmm. talking with someone yesterday um, and she was saying, I feel like you're kind of a natural. She's she's an Enneagram person. So she's, she said, you know, you feel like you're kind of a natural teacher. Uh, my grandfather was a pastor. Both of his parents were pastors. Um, so I've always felt a calling to the ministry, not in terms of being a professional pre preacher, but in terms of service. So I've always volunteered with the church and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but it, as for a living, you know, I sell hair care products, it's, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm feeling like there might be a way for me to step out and, and do even more than I'm doing now. And, and so I'm really excited about where things are going. Yeah. And we have to bless the businesses we have because I'm a caterer, yeah. you know, I cook for people yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, we need that to pay the bills and then to see where it all goes. But they, right. somebody, uh, Silver Birch, who has spoken through Maurice Barbonell in the trance state, mm -hmm. and would say service is the coin of spirit. And yeah. it doesn't take, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a big coin. I mean, it, little things can make a difference. Because, Absolutely. Brian, I mean, I'm grateful that you found my show and and the other things that you've done. But I often take for granted the interviews that I have. I put them out in the world and, you know, I very rarely meet or talk to someone that listens, um, but it could change one life. And so you don't know what person that stumbles upon your site, your podcast, a blog post, and it's exactly what they need to hear and they feel Oh, okay. I, I'm not alone in this. I mean, you just never know the difference right. you can make. So I'll help you any way I can. 
Yeah, you, you don't know. And, I, and you hear people when they have near-death experiences and they have the life reviews and they find a lot of times it's the little things that are really the big things. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's smiling at a stranger. It's, you know, petting a dog. You know, there's a there's a lady in the neighborhood that I that I, I see all the time and, uh, you know, just stopping and, 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 and talking to her and, you know, taking the time to pet her dog every day. I mean, and when her dog passed away, you know, she was like, she told people she was really grateful for that. You know, and so that's, something that doesn't take any time out of my day, but it, it really, you know, means a lot to some, to, to her. Um, but I, I want to go back to also what you said about the business. And I, I don't, I think I, I was coaching someone the other day and she's after her daughter passed, she said, well, I really want to do something of service. I want to, you know, I want to quit this, what I'm doing now. Uh, and I want to open up a spiritual, a spiritual store. And I want to, you know, I, and I said, well, don't, forget about the things you're doing already. You know, you, you have a couple of other daughters that you're very, very involved with. You need to be there for them. They're, they're at a young time of their life. So that's going to take your time. You know, you've got other commitments, but, but maybe you just do some, some things that you consider small things that serve people. Um, so if I, for like myself with, you know, with Shana, it's been, it's been four years um, and I still haven't made a transition. I don't know if I ever will make a full transition, but I started off just, you know, helping with helping parents heal, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like that. You can volunteer at church. So it doesn't have to be, you know, major life shifts. It doesn't. And what you're meant to do will find you. It'll keep knocking at your door. You'll get this, like, I've got to see this movie today. You know, these things yeah. will start happening when they're meant to. And I, I would have never guessed 30 years ago, I would be doing what I'm doing right now. Cause I wasn't a believer, but we're not shown the big picture. We're just shown what we need to, to take the next step. And if we can have that faith, it'll all work out because hair care products and me feeding the guys at the races, it's service, yeah, different kinds yeah. of service. And we can't overlook that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when you, I'm sure when you started the podcast, I don't know if you had any idea how, how big it would become Heck no, <laughs> or, or how many people you'd reach no. or, that that day, you know, almost four years ago, when I discovered your podcast, you had no idea that I was listening. When I listened to your your audio, you know, you had no idea. You know, you just put it out there, and you, you know, if, if you reached me, you reached thousands of other people. Um, so that's what we that's what we do. We 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 put our seeds out there, and we don't even know which ones are going to grow. We don't know what a word we say is going, you know, how it's going to help someone. And I, I was interviewing Elizabeth Bassan for my podcast the other day. And I said, you know, when, when Morgan passed, her son passed, I'm sure. And you started parents united and lost. It wasn't even called helping parents heal at the time. You had no idea it was going to grow to an international organization of like 12,000 people. Um, and she's literally saved thousands of lives. And I, I don't, yes. I don't usually exaggerate, but I know because I've had people tell us helping parents heal saved my life. I found you just when I needed you. Um, so we have to have faith that what we put out there, if we put it out there with good intentions, will help somebody else. Absolutely. And I do get that about saving lives. I hit an all time low as a human being grieving the loss of my, at my dad's death. And then I lost very close relationships. We were one of those families that fought. And mm -hmm. although I didn't choose to check out of life, I realized and for the very first time had compassion for what a human would feel like to be that low, that that seems like a good idea. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, um, for me as a parent, and I'm, I'm very open about this and I know it, it, some people probably think it's not a good thing to do, but I think it is. Um, I was never suicidal to the point where I planned suicide. But I was to the point where I did not want to be here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast and I don't think it was on your show. I think it was Roberta Grimes. But there was a woman on and she had written a book and she was talking about what happened after her daughter passed. And I remember her saying she was on the, on the curb and a bus was coming by and she thought about stepping out in front of the bus. And when I heard that, I was like, OK, I've had that same feeling. You know, I've, I've felt like just you have that feeling where I, I don't want to be here. I want to be with my kid. Um, and it, it, it actually helped me to hear another person say that. Mm -hmm. 
And no, she didn't do it, by the way. She wrote a book and she was doing a podcast. She overcame that feeling, but she had the feeling. So I want to be able to be transparent enough for people to say, hey, I know what you're feeling. I've, I've felt what you're feeling and you can you can still survive this, um, which is why I'll do anything I can to, you know, to help people. So like when you asked me today if I would do that reading, I, I've done several public readings um, because I want people to know that this is real, that your kid's still here. And if it takes me exposing some of my stuff, OK, I'll do that. That's great. Thank you. That's great. And for our listener, go to episode three two zero. And it's actually a video episode. So you can see us on YouTube. I want to ask you, Brian, about helping parents heal the website and also the online group, because I do know we have lots of listeners in our uh, listeners right now uh, that are parents and just a little bit about both. Because I know on the online group, there's all kinds of stuff that happens in Zoom rooms Uh, and things like that as well. Yeah, I love to talk about helping parents heal. Helping parents heal uh, dot org, I believe it is. I mm-hmm. think it's dot org. Yep. Helping parents heal dot org is our website. Um, it's the website just got updated. It's brand new. It's awesome. Um, we have groups all over the world, literally, as I said, about I think about twelve thousand members now, uh, and there are local chapters, so you can look for a chapter in your area. Now there are a couple things. We don't have chapters everywhere. And the other thing is a lot of times parents, when they're going through, especially the early stages of grief, they don't really want to meet face to face. They don't know how well they're going to be able to handle talking about their kids, et cetera. So we put together the online group a couple of years ago. And the online group is, first of all, it's conversation. So you can get on there and just pour your heart out to people who won't think you're crazy. Um, We have a group. We have a group of caring listeners. So if you're really feeling bad and you really need someone to talk to. We've got people that will take your phone calls. Um, And then we have a lot of people that volunteer their time to speak to our parents. So it's a closed group. We do it by Zoom, which is online teleconferencing. And we've had some of the best mediums in the world, some of the best healers in the world. People have had near-death experiences, authors that will come on and and address the parents and and answer our questions. We get to answer questions to them, you know, one-on-one about things like soul planning, uh, why wasn't my child healed? You know, um, what's the afterlife like? What are our kids doing over there all day? Um, can they still see me? Um, uh, most of the mediums will tell us you can talk to your children yourselves. So they'll tell, they'll give us techniques to do that. Um, on the website, going back to the website itself, we have a list of providers. So if you're looking for a medium or a healer or a grief counselor, we've got people that have been, um, been vetted, I would say, by helping parents heal to say these are people that that you can trust. Um, So I know, like, for example, mediumship is very controversial. There are people that don't don't trust them. But Mm -hmm. um, Mark Ireland, who is one of the founders of Helping Parents Heal, has a certification program where he puts mediums through a series of blind tests that they have to pass to pass a certification program. So we've got a list of those people. So we can say, hey, at least you know these people have integrity. You know they've been tested, so you know you could you can check them out. Yeah, there's a big difference in mediumship with someone who says, oh, "Okay, I've got a man with you. Do you have a man that passed?" Right, and then it's up to you yeah. to say, uh, "Yeah, it was my dad." Uh, you know, and so while I don't believe all poor mediums are con artists, I think that there's a level of training that hasn't yet happened, and so one of the reasons we did do episode three twenty was to show in demonstration what's available, what kind of level of mediumship is available and to help mediums and people know um, a level to to reach for. Because if we can make mediumship more on like a level playing field that people can expect to go in and just say yes or no and not have to give the medium all the whole explanation, whatever that may be, I just think that will extinguish some of the the lesser ones you know that aren't really making a difference or might not have the integrity to help the grieving heart yeah it's you know mediumship i tell people it's like any other profession there are good mediums there are bad mediums there are fraudulent mediums um there are people that have good intentions they're just not very good um and there aren't there aren't too many standards there aren't too many real certification programs so that's why 
Mark mm-hmm. started the certification program so you could have some faith in the people that he that he puts behind it. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in mediumship. I am absolutely 99.99% sure I, it's to be like Gary Schwartz and never say I'm 100% sure, <laughs> but I'm 99.99% sure that mediumship is real. But I'm skeptical of individual mediums because you don't know what any individual how good they're going to be or how, what kind of integrity they're going to have. So you, you're right to be skeptical uh, and you're right to, I would say to people, I, I tell people, I would never go see a medium without a reference. Um, I would always talk to someone who's been to them. I will look for certifications, um, but at the very least, a reference. Um, so just like you wouldn't probably go see a surgeon who you, know, you don't know anything about without checking out their record, I would say with the medium, you, you want to you know what their background is. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, just even like bad restaurants, eventually they disappear. And I think with enough good restaurants, people go to them. And so I like the idea that helpingparentsheal.org has a list of recommended. And uh, I do love that Mark Ireland did the work to do some certification. So I'm out to share good ones as well. And um, someday there'll be the list of we don't die recommended mediums, but Someday. Yeah. <laughs> That's not too soon. I've got a lot of things yeah, on my well, plate. I tell you, Mark has a full time job and it's it's a lot of work to it go is. through the program that, that he does. Mm-hmm. And you know, I just interviewed a guy for my podcast yesterday who just passed the program. It's a lot of work for the mediums too. Yes, of and course. A lot of the mediums don't want to give up that time because it's it's five readings. They've got to get a certain score. Uh, it's totally blind. So they are told nothing about the sitter. Uh, the the protocol keeps getting tougher actually as we find different ways that people can cheat. Um, so for example, now Mark doesn't give out even the name of the person and they meet by uh, Zoom or Skype or something where the medium doesn't know who the, they don't get the, they don't get the person's phone number. They don't get anything until like five minutes before the reading. I love it. Um, so we want to do everything we can to make sure there's some, as much integrity as possible. And what's really interesting is the good mediums, they want that. I mean, the guy I was talking to earlier today, he said, I don't want to know anything about my sitter. And he said, I don't, I don't want to, to hot read the sitter or I always get hot read, a cold read. Cold read. I don't want the cold read the sitter. He's like, I will actually uh, sometimes look away. And I was talking to a medium friend of mine the other day and she had gone to something. They were talking about the different techniques that mediums use to cheat. So she said, from now on, when I do my gallery readings, I'm going to close my eyes because not only do I not want to cheat, but I don't, I don't want to get cues because mediums are very sensitive people and we can learn to read. Mm-hmm. I'm not a medium, but we can learn to read body language. And if someone's nodding or shaking their head or crossing their arms, you can kind of get a feeling, even non-verbally, how they're answering. Yes. So a lot of memes are saying, now, I'm not even going to look at you. I don't, I don't want to look at you. So um, as I said, I, there are very, very good and very mediums with integrity. And I, I've got hundreds of stories I can share of mediums that have given me hits on things that they could never possibly know. Um, just out of the blue. So I can say for certain it's real. I love it. Isn't it fun to be swimming in this pool? Is that even the word expression I want to use? I don't know. But just to be on this journey of investigation and, and then talk about the friends, probably you like myself, uh, especially you and I, you make these friendships and they're on a different level than work related or how's the weather or superficial. Uh, I mean, these are real true friendships. It's, it's, it's their family. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I was talking to Elizabeth the other day and I'm like, help me parents heal. Is, they're my family. So we, we went to, um, we did a conference last April and in, in Scottsdale and at the conference, okay, imagine you've got 500 people whose children have passed away. So this, the hotel staff thought this is going to be the saddest weekend ever. And we were sitting there, you know, at the pool at night and having drinks and stuff. And people kept asking, who are those people over in the corner that are just laughing it up and stuff? And they're like, oh, those are the grieving parents. But, um, <laughs> no. you know, we were sitting around the fire one night. I remember telling that we were like, OK, first of all, we all felt like this was planned, that we, we, were, we were going. We were on a mission together. And the way I describe it is literally we're on a mission together. And I'm like, one day we're going to be sitting around a fire pit on the other side having a conversation and reminiscing about everything that we've been through. So when you look at it that way and you look at these people that you've made these relationships with as your buddies in your troop, um, it just gives you a special bond that, you know, you don't have with other people. 
And and I think even with you uh, or people even outside the, of the parents who have lost children, but people that understand the greater reality, we're living in a different world than most of the people here are. And I don't mean to sound arrogant, but they're kind of still asleep to what the real reality is. And we're in a twilight. We're living in both worlds. We, 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 we're getting a glimpse. We're getting, we're getting a little bit of memory of where we came from. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, so we're in this world, as, you know, but we're not of it, as Jesus would say. Um, and, and knowing that makes it tolerable and makes us really, really want to serve as best we can while we're here. Plus, we all know we have this life review coming up. And <laughs> yes. We're going to judge ourselves. And, uh, you know, I, I know I've cleaned up my act a lot since I figured out that I'm going to be the one judging myself. Right. Right. Absolutely. Wow. And I just want to mention Helping Parents Heal is having an April 2020 conference in mm-hmm. Charleston, South Carolina, April 16th through 19th. And go to helpingparentsheal.org and you can find out more about that conference. I couldn't believe that there has been money donated toward it to bring the price down. So it is extremely reasonably priced to attend. And I just feel so grateful. It, that- it, it is. It's reasonably priced to attend. And, and it's also to do the generosity of the people that we're going to have speak because these people generally, a lot of them charge thousands of dollars and they're donating their time. So, um, it's it's just it's amazing the the help that people have given to the organization, and I want to encourage anybody that's even thinking about going. It's a weekend that will it'll change your it'll change your life. I mean, literally, it, we had people I've made lifelong friends at the first one. Now, some of these people I knew online, but I met for the first time there. But some people that I hadn't met before that you know we've become very very uh, close friends since the, since the conference. And I think we had about. We sold out the first conference, I think it was 550 people, and I think they're expecting about 1,000 for the one next year. That's amazing. That's really great. Well, Brian, we're approaching the top of the hour here. I think it's time to conclude a little bit. Is there anything I haven't asked you or anything you want to share or any closing words of inspiration that only you, Brian Smith, can give? No, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me on. Uh, it was a couple of years ago that we met, and uh, I, this has been like you're you're my hero when it comes to this world, and you're one of the per, one of the people that really inspired me to do the things that I'm doing. Um, and I want to say to people that um, people that have might, might have lost children and hearing about this for the first time that there is hope um, after after your child passes. Um, you'll notice we don't. I don't use the word died. I typically don't use the word lost um, because I know that my daughter is still right here with me, and I'm on a mission to help as many people know that as I possibly can. So if there's anything I can do to help you out, you know, let me know. Contact me at grief to growth.com. It's uh, grief the number two growth. Um, you can you can email me through there or check out my podcast, and um, hopefully I'll help some people out. Oh, I think you already have. And uh, my recommendation is just keep being yourself because that seems to work for me. And (laughs) just have love in your heart and keep being on that journey to grow and discover and then just keep sharing it. And that's the magic. Pretty simple formula. But I'll share your things as well. Thanks, I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And for our listener, thank you for spending this hour with Brian Smith and myself as a reminder. Or maybe you don't know this. This could be your first episode. All past episodes are available at wedontdieradio.com as well as on YouTube. And the last 100 are on iTunes. If you go to wedontdieradio.com, I give you a free copy of my audio that Brian was talking about, How to Survive Grief. I also have a PDF file of my 19 Reasons to Believe in the Afterlife. And it says, read several chapters of my book. But here's the secret. It's the whole book when you open up. Um, So I want you to be able to get this information. I really expand upon grief in chapter 10 of the book. And and it's important. If you want to see me live and in person, I'll be one of the speakers at the upcoming IANS International Conference 2019. IANS stands for the International Association for Near-Death Studies. It's going to be held 
in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, August 29th through September 1st. I'm also leading my own workshops uh, August 11th through 15th with some of my close friends in the world of mediumship and afterlife studies and um, pretty cool. It's a five-day discovery course that we can be on the court and really discovering our own potential and recording things like trans images from beyond and so much more, so much more. But in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I'm always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul, that your life here on earth is important. It's for a reason. When you start getting into these kind of conversations, it really gives, instead of years to your life, life to your years. And for all of us, when we look back upon this life, this final time, like Brian said, with that life review, you really want to feel like you've made the most of it. I think we all do. And it doesn't matter if you're 18 or 88. You know, we start wherever we are. We're the perfect place. So you are supported. You're one of a kind. You are loved. You are surrounded by love, even if you can't see it. It is real. Life after death is real. So thank you for listening, my friend, and we'll see you soon.